Today's podcast is brought to you in part by Real Marketing, the only marketing firm recommended exclusively by the Institute. Real Marketing utilizes over 25 years of expertise and their products are built and customized for you to dominate any neighborhood, anywhere. Go to realmarketingforyou.com. That's real marketing, the number four, you.com. Also look for past A State of Mind episodes with CEO David Collins as our guest. Tanya, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Tammy. Glad to be here. Well, we are delighted to have you, and I'd love for our audience to get to know you a little better. So by way of introduction, um, tell us about yourself and, uh, and your market area. Um, yeah, I got my license in two, six, 2016 uh, when we moved back to Spokane. I grew up in the area, a small town outside of Spokane, and Spokane is home, and we decided to move back. I have an eight-year-old and an 11-year-old now, so moved back here to be close to family. And uh, my happy place is the lakes, um, Lake Roosevelt out here. So it's, yeah, drew us back home. Excellent. And I I have to say that you and I have actually known each other for quite a long time in uh, some other different capacities. So it is, it is wonderful to to have you in this space and uh, to get to spend some time with you. So I'm curious, what kinds of properties do you work with primarily and, and what price points? I would say that luxury is my focus. I list and sell everything. And I would say that my average is probably between 800 and 1.5. Okay, great. And is it mostly single family homes? Yes, mostly single family homes. We just have a few condos and, and townhomes here. In great. I think that's always good for, uh, for the audience to get a sense of uh, what the brick and mortar looks like. Yes, no row homes, just, yeah, mainly single family homes. Great. Well, we're here to talk about marketing those luxury listings. And so I want to kind of start from nuts and bolts in terms of preparation. And uh, tell us what steps you take when you're preparing a listing for marketing. I would say it always starts with the, the stager. Um, if it's vacant, I'm going to recommend the home get staged with the, the stager's furniture, right? And usually people are, the sellers are living in the home. So it's the stager coming into the home and doing a consultation for the seller. And it's going through and putting, we want each room to have its best foot forward. So we, a lot of times it's decluttering, sometimes more than others, um, rearranging and just helping each room show its best. Sometimes maybe we bring in additional pieces to help uh, showcase that room, but usually it's each house can look great just with some small tweaks. So that leads me to ask, do you have different stagers that you use for different types of of homes or different price points? Uh, Nope. I work with the same stager for all price points. All right. And so that that probably means that you have a really solid relationship with them as well. Yes, um, they do great. Uh, Staging consults, um, they have, yeah, the best staging company in town, uh, customer service, product, um, and follow through. Absolutely. Here's a question that I get all the time. Who pays for the staging? The homeowner pays for the staging when it's part of the home. Um, I pay for the consultation. So the consultation, it's a win-win. I want the house to show its best. The seller wants the house to show its best. And there is something to be said about having the stager come in and tell the seller um, from a third party that some items need to be removed or a wall needs to be painted, um, or, you know, whatever they love probably isn't going to be best um, for the buyers to see in their home. So having that consult done is a game changer. And, um, and then also, I, I, I know here in Spokane, a lot of people don't go to their staging consults, but I take that as an opportunity to go and learn more about my sellers and build a better relationship with them. Uh, the sellers will ask, or the uh, stager will ask different questions to the sellers that I might not have asked. Um, and just really, you know, it's emotional time for sellers when, they, when they're when they selling, right? 
And so the more that I can learn about them, the better I'm able to serve them um, from beginning to end. Well, that surprises me that you say that uh, that other realtors are not going to that staging consultation. I, I, I wouldn't imagine doing that, but it sounds like that's something that really sets you apart as well. I, I find it to be very valuable, for sure. Excellent. Excellent. And what about um, any pre-inspections or repairs? What kinds of things are you focused on in terms of preparation? If... It all depends on the house, but if something needs to be done, I absolutely recommend to have that repaired beforehand. Uh, taking a little bit of time, spending the money up front will make for a much smoother transaction and help the sellers net the most money and less time, you, you know, don't want to be going on and off the market and things like that. So taking care of it ahead of time, would I would absolutely recommend. Sure. And then once you've got it all ready to go, then you've got photography. So tell us what that looks like for you. Um, I do professional photography every single time, no matter the price point. Um, bad listing photos is a pet peeve of mine. And um, yeah, so and high um, HDR, um, professional. That's high definition resolution? Yes. Okay. Making sure I, am I saying that right? Um, yeah, the best... You know, a lot of times you'll see, you know, certainly iPhone or whatever photos out there, right, that are taken with a cell phone or just top down looking. It's just so unprofessional. It's just nobody wants to go into that house and it just doesn't show. So people determine whether or not they want to go into a home from the photos that they see online. So doing really high quality photography is always a must. I'm with you on that pet peeve for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so we, we talk a lot in the upper tier about marketing being storytelling, if you will. Mm -hmm. So um, how do you determine what story you're going to tell about a property? You've, you've, you've touched on uh, making sure that each room has the right character and, and that sort of thing. But how do, you, how do you get your hands around the story of the overall property? I look at what type of buyer is most likely to be buying that home. What, um, what is the industry that is driving wealth to that neighborhood? Um, what, what are, you know, is there a sought after school district that that home's in? What are the best features? Um, is it a, you know, old historic home? Is it new and modern? And just really looking at the, that home and the characters and what types of buyers are really going to be most interested in that particular type of home. And are most of your homeowners there um, primary homeowners or do you have a second home market? It's mainly primary. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned um, the lakes in the area. Mm -hmm. um, how does that influence uh, lifestyle decisions or uh, does that come into play with the lake properties? Um, I would say that most people here in Spokane are buying primary homes not usually on the lakes, but they'll have, you know, second cabins or lake homes out on their lake place. So a little bit of that. Um, it's not the main draw. Going next door to Coeur d'Alene and, and lakefront property over there would be a different story, though. And you mentioned that there's quite a lot of lakes nearby. Yes, there's 76 lakes within an hour of Spokane. Wow, that's pretty amazing. That's pretty so, amazing. Of course, I'm in an area that's surrounded by water, but uh, a very different type until you get to the, the interior of, of Florida. Mm -hmm. So when, when you've identified who the likely buyer is, as we were just talking about, um, how is it that you reach them, right? What techniques do you use to reach that, that likely buyer? You've got the story. Um, how do you tell it and where do you tell it? Big thing is video. I always do a, a video for all properties, um, regardless of price. Um, and oftentimes I'm in the video, I'm kind of telling the story and going back and forth. I found that that actually creates more engagement, more viewers, and helps people watch a lot longer than if not. So it's really being creative with the, with the video and the story that you're creating. And and I use it on YouTube, um, is linked to the MLS, uh, social media, Facebook, Instagram, starting with TikTok, and 
really promote it that way. And so when you're using the social media and YouTube, are you utilizing hashtags or um, are you oh, yes, paying absolutely. for advertising? I do some paying for advertising. Yes. You know, with the market changing here, it's getting creative and doing different things all the time. Um, but absolutely have, you know, a main set of hashtags that we use a lot and then different hashtags for, uh, you know, different videos and things like that. Sure. And for, for really kind of drilling to, to who might pick up on that hashtag exactly. that's the likely audience. Exactly. It, you know, if you're doing a historic home versus a modern home and things like that. Got it. And so for, for those members of the Institute, there's also access to the WE prospecting tool that allows you to, uh, to, to generate lists of prospects uh, based on level of wealth and interests and that sort of thing. Yes, I'm excited to dive into that more. Excellent. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about your benchmark standards, um, professional photos, staging at least at some basic level, uh, videography. Um, let's talk about the collateral. So do you use local resources for your property brochures, postcards, and things like that? I'm actually the biggest fan of real marketing. Uh -huh. That was not a paid plug for the audience's benefit. <laughs> They, um, they're the best. Their personal brochures, I, um, well, personal brochures, property brochures, um, all of it. It's, it's helped me get listings, client, it impresses people, it impresses people if you're coming to an open house, sellers, buyers, anybody, people want that. I even met with, um, showed a house, um, couple weeks ago and the listing agent had seen the seller, her seller had seen one of my brochures and told the agent that they wanted a brochure like mine. Oh, <laughs> wow. So it gets noticed and yeah, people, the touch, the feel, the everything is a game changer. Um, one thing I would say to people is um, if you have, for instance, say a million Say at a million dollar price point, that's when lux that's when you're seeing realtors do the nice property brochures. But then you have say a seven hundred thousand dollar listing, and are you going to do a nice property brochure or not? I would say always make sure to spend the money and do the nice property brochure. It stands out, and you always want to show that you're doing the best quality. Absolutely. And, and it becomes a reflection on you uh, that really resonates. And, and that leads into the idea that, um, that every dollar that we spend marketing a particular listing really should be leveraged to generate more business. And so uh, yep. I'm with you. I'll take that $750,000, uh, $800,000 seller all day long. And I want them to feel as though they're going to get million dollar treatment. And of course, that price point is scalable in, in anyone's market who's listening, but uh, it's setting that, uh, that benchmark standard that I think is, is really important. And how do you, how do you distribute your brochures and, and postcards? I'm assuming that you've got yeah. some sort of mailing campaign. Do you, do you farm a particular area? I farm a particular area. I actually have two, I have, a, I have a neighborhood that I farm that I've been doing for a couple of years that's been awesome. And then I recently started another um, area as well um, that's more unique. But um, I mean, yeah, I do. So that is a monthly mailer that I do through real marketing. Um, and then for the property brochures, I have property brochures that are in the home that are left in the home. And then sometimes we'll do a mailing of that particular property brochure to potential buyers out there based Great. on, you know, pulling criteria and data of who might be the most likely to purchase a home like that. And I imagine that uh, postcards come into play to celebrate a successful sale or announce a new listing, that sort of thing, just kind of adding Exa to that. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I think consistency is key. Would you agree? I would 100% agree. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. And it's not something that happens overnight with, you know, like the neighborhood, um, the neighborhood marketing that they do, but it's, I have gotten so many compliments over it. I just got an email from somebody the other day who said, I just wanted to let you know that I'm going to call you when I sell my house in less than two years. 
um, they're not ready yet, but like they see it and they appreciate it. And if they took the time to actually uh, make a comment about it, that means that it's it, it's really making an impression. And, and that's what yes. we want. It's for the, the long term. But you brought up a good point just a second ago. Uh, it is uh, it is not a magic bullet. Right. You can't just uh, implement one one piece of marketing, whether it's to, to get a, a listing sold or whether it's to generate more. But um, it takes consistency and that that commitment to level of quality. It doesn't just happen overnight. Correct. I'm glad you said that. Um, so how about property websites? Great question. I do a featured property website. Uh, for all my listings. Um, I actually have a feature property section on my website. So every property is highlighted with one URL. And then it has all the um, house information, the all the photos, the video, the property data information. If there's a matter for it, it has it all there. And so that way, when we market, we can use that exclusive website to to link to different um, social media as, um, marketing and things like that. Sure, and I find that that people, just people in general, are more willing to go to a property website if they have direct access than they are to go to a realtor's website to click through to get to the, the, the properties. And also, I would say a lot of times I name the house. And so um, going back to that, I'd say a lot of some people are willing to spend more money for a house with the name. And it's true. It, it's, you know, it's not a lot, but it all adds up. And um, and so using that name as the URL just makes it easy to type it in for properties um, for people, too. So I want to talk about this naming strategy for a second, and I may be putting you on the spot, but can you think of a property that you that you named uh, that that really is special to you, and and can you tell us how you arrived at that? Um, I would say, I guess the Porchside Manor comes to mind. How it came about was, I guess the type of home. It has some porches up front. Um, I was the fifth listing agent on that property, wow. and we got it sold. Excellent, excellent, excellent. All right. And uh, we, we talked about social media, so we know that you're, you're using that as a part of your overall plan. Um, tell me whether you have in your market area or in your particular business model, uh, do you have luxury specific brokers open houses? Um, I, well, they're just starting to come back, right? Ah, yes, that's true. <laughs> um, a lot of times they fly off the shelf so fast. We didn't have the opportunity. Um, but when um, I'm able to, I'm a big fan of doing brokers open. It's great to get other agents in there for multiple reasons, build a better relationship with those agents that you're doing cross sales with, get their opinions on different things and really showcase the property. So do you, yeah. do, you do something different in the upper tier than you would for, you know, a, um, a, an ordinary price point in terms of really trying to get those those brokers that are working in that price point there? Um, I, I haven't done like a fancy party per se yet, um, but I do like I'll do an email campaign to email realtors. I'll do personal texts and even calls because, you know, in today's day and age, most people are getting so many emails and texts that they don't see it and they yeah. don't, you know, so having that personal invite really makes people like, oh, wow, okay, they would, you know, be, you would value their opinion to come and see this property. So I found that that goes a long ways. Wow, good old fashioned phone call. Yes, human conversation. Absolutely, absolutely. So as the market shifts, and we know that it's going to be a little more challenging to, to sell higher priced homes, um, what things or ideas have you picked up on uh, recently or that you've been sitting on that you can't wait to try um, when you're marketing a property that, that isn't going to fly off the shelf? Yeah. I mean, I'm excited to create a, a big party and really drive realtors to come to an event, to come and see people and come and see a spectacular listing. Excellent. And, yeah. Bring in, bring in, in you know, everything from the catering to the cars, video, obviously, and just going to the nines. 
right? And a lot of our members have been very successful in working with related vendors. So uh, for example, we, we were talking about lakes a little while ago. So, mm -hmm. so maybe a, a boat broker or um, you know, uh, somebody who does custom uh, dock houses or something like that mm -hmm. to really kind of be a partner and, and make it really exciting. So um, I, I hope that you'll, you'll share that when you, when you do something super exciting, let us know so that we can, we can yeah. follow along. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit more about niche marketing, right? The ways to really, really target the, the right perspective off of, uh, the right perspective audience. So there's tons of ways that we can spend money advertising properties. Um, how do you sift through all the various media that's available to you to pick the ones most likely to reach the ideal buyer? I look at where most people are moving to Spokane from, and I try to target people in those areas. So Excellent. for instance, in Spokane, we have a really big draw from Seattle and Portland um, down in California. And so really market to people who live in those areas. And are you building relationships with realtors in those areas too, to kind of, uh, uh, stoke the stoke the pot there as much as possible. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. And I know that we we had the opportunity uh, just recently to be together in person at the Institute's Leaders in Luxury conference. And that was a, a great way to jumpstart that again, as we uh, as we shift into a, a different kind of market. So I also want to make note that members of the Institute have access to uh, a number of different targeted media with preferred pricing like Unique Homes or the Rob Report or um, uh, Mansion Global, uh, those publications that reach a particular price point or particular type of uh, individual based on industry. You mentioned that that you that you really think about what industries are fueling your market areas. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's something that that you'll find, I think, particular publications or even digital platforms that that speak to those audiences. You mentioned a little bit about your uh, regional feeder markets. Do you have an international audience? Minimal. It's minimal. minimal. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And mm -hmm. when you do see international clients, um, uh, where where are they coming from, and and what what is the draw for them? If you can if you can tell. I mean, I would Canada is some. Uh -huh. um, it's close, and it's in the states for them, and it's a smaller, small big city. Spokane's only about two hundred twenty thousand in city limits, about over just over five hundred with the surrounding area. So Excellent. We're not a big market per se. Excellent, excellent. So um, there's there's always a, a little bit of influence in every market, but um, but I was curious about uh, about your Spokane. So um, so Tanya, knowing that you haven't been in the um, in the real estate business for like a lifetime, like so many people around us, um, I'm curious about. Um, how you have the the, the confidence to uh, uh, to jump in with both feet, and in particular, uh, I mentioned the Leaders in Luxury Conference, and uh, and there was a, a competition. Members were invited to oh. submit personal videos and uh, and property videos, and mm -hmm. you stepped right up and put forth one in each category and actually walked away the winner of the personal marketing video, which, um, which I absolutely loved. And we've actually now incorporated that into our training. Uh, but I know that there's a lot of folks that just wouldn't have that level of confidence. And uh, so, so I'm curious whether there's anything that you can share uh, that might help somebody get, you know, maybe a little more out of their shell. I would, I would say just, the importance of getting out there and doing it and it doesn't have to be perfect and doing it is better than not doing it. And you can have edits and retakes and as many as you need and going, taking the time to spend, spend the money on yourself and your business to show other people what's important to you and why they should hire you over somebody else is worth every penny. It's much more important to spend your money on that versus money on Zillow leads or some other lead source. So I'm a big proponent of, I don't do any of that. I spend my money on my marketing to, cause that's how I drive my business is yeah. I, yeah. All about going the extra step 
the extra mile and not cutting costs um, to really set standards for my clients and new expect and expectations. It makes a lot of sense. I, I think treating it as a business with uh, with long term goals is really important. And so, uh, as we talk about goals, I'm curious, what's on your bucket list professionally um, for, let's say, the, the year ahead? What, what goals do you have? I, you know, this has been the year, Tammy, that I didn't have, like, a first year, I didn't have a sales goal. Um, backing up, I should say, I got my license, I told you, in 2016. But I was in the real estate closet until the fall of 18. Oh, I've never heard that before. That's fantastic. <laughs> I, um, you know, I, I had another business I was running. I had the, uh, a client gift business. So, which is where I met you, right? I yeah. would go to a lot of top masterminds and conferences, primarily working with realtors and lenders across the country. And um, with the Institute being my favorite classes always, which is where I learned so much that has actually helped me today um, with marketing and customer service and all those tools and everything. Um, and I forgot what else I was going to say about that. Well, but, you were, well the sales, you were, right? Yeah, you were mentioning that this In was the first, the first year that you didn't have yeah. a, a specific concrete sales uh, uh, goal. Yeah. So I got my license 16, didn't do anything for two years and then, um, just quadrupled my business for multiple years and, you know, super happy with what I've been able to accomplish. And so this year was my goal of not really setting a sales goal, but of just really honing in on Avenue stone real estate and what I want the, the team and the company to look like. So, Excellent. And so are you going to, are you going to follow that same path for the year ahead in, uh, in, in being fluid? Or are you going to uh, stick with your, your sales background and have some tangible, <laughs> measurable um, goals? Well, we'll have some, some measurable goals. Well, we'll yes. But they change, sure. don't they? They, 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 change they change as you develop. Yes, they do. And then sometimes you don't set them high enough and you go bigger. So yeah. I know sometimes it's more important uh, to focus on um, the the bigger picture, right? It's not necessarily a number of transactions, but it's uh, uh, it's about doing a really good job and generating mm -hmm. more referrals. And so yes. um, let's see uh, if you had the opportunity to take any listing at all in your marketplace, is there one that you just like, wait for it to become available and you'd, you'd work really hard to get it of one that's currently on the market with somebody else or no just, no it did just any any just any. any it could be on the market or it could be uh the, the the one that you've driven by for years and you think gosh if i ever had the opportunity i, I would say all of them I <laughs> oh, great answer great answer i love it i love it well, as we as we wind up our time together, um, I really want to thank you. I want to thank you for for jumping in with both feet. I want to thank you for being bold enough to step out and put yourself forward. Um, and uh, and I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, to be with us on the uh, uh, on the podcast today. And uh, uh, if there's any parting words that you have, this would be the time. Nothing else I can think of. Probably the moment we jump off the phone I'll, or call, I'll have something, right? Of Tammy? course, of <laughs> course, of course. Well, for now then, uh, I'm going to let uh, Tanya off the hot seat and I'm going to thank all of you for joining us on this episode of A State of Mind, The Art of Selling Luxury Real Estate. If you're interested in learning more about the Institute, you can find more at luxuryhomemarketing.com. If you like what you just heard, please share it with a friend and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast.